Hey, everybody. Welcome to another Horse Geeks podcast. I'm Kirsten Nelson, professional horse trainer. And with me once again is Deb Romero, Alexander Technique instructor and developer of Optimal Posture is your business, right? Yes. Okay. And today's topic is a little bit about posture. So I call what I do training for optimal balance, where Deb calls what she does optimal posture. And today we wanted to talk about the topic being, do we have a confirmation problem with our horses or is it a posture problem? So what is confirmation and what is posture and how do we tell the difference, right? So the conversation Deb and I sort of started with on this idea was when you look around at different sports and different horse activities, you can almost tell by the body development of the horse. Sometimes the breed is popular in certain sports versus others, but the body development can make horses look very different, like a Western horse versus a dressage horse or a race horse versus a trail horse or a jumping horse uh, versus a polo horse. So there's a little bit of a, what we call a body type that can become associated with particular sports. It becomes the norm. And I tend to explain that to people as the fashion of the sport, ah, not fashion. necessarily. It's, yeah, or it's the current trend or it's what people believe around that particular sport. But when it comes right down to it, all horses share the same anatomy. Right. So shouldn't, shouldn't well-developed anatomy the right muscles that support good movement be the same, no matter the sport, right? And then people will choose horses a lot of times based on confirmation or people, it, it becomes, and it's a little bit of an irritation to me, you can tell, but it becomes <laughs> uh, saying that our horses have bad confirmation <clears throat> becomes like this unchangeable death sentence that your horse can no longer progress to the next level yes. of competition, or you're just stuck with what you're stuck with. This is how they move, take it or leave it. It's unchangeable wow. when we label it as confirmation, because technically confirmation is unchangeable. So we'll kind of talk about posture and confirmation, fashion versus authentically good function is the topic for today. And that's kind of a, it's a big topic. So we'll see where we go with that. Yeah. So with people, like your business is optimal posture. So how would you explain the difference between confirmation and posture? That's a good one. I'll try to keep it really basic. Um, so the confirmation to me is the bony structure with the soft tissue hanging on it. The bones are the bones and 90% of us all have the same anatomical skeleton. Yes, with, with uh, some deviation, but not um, much. <clears throat> right, right. Everybody has their own little whatevers, but posture to me is adding a lot of things. It's adding habit, it's ha adding um, how you use your body in certain instances. Those are posturings to me. Um, so to, you could even say confirmation is static. I mean, it's a structure, whereas yes. posture is movement and how you're using yourself in it's your daily dynamic. activities. Yes, yeah. it's a, it, I like to that me, dynamic. I would say the same thing. Like to me, confirmation really boils down to what's the size, length, density mm -hmm. of the bones, right? So that you can't change. Right. How much, how many slow twitch, fast twitch muscles the horse has that you can't change. But posture to me is dynamic. And that yes. is a change of the bony coordination within motion. So you can make vast changes in what appear to be conformational issues when you change the posture. And will you share that story of the lady you worked with? <laughs> because it was diagnosed as a confirmation issue in her body. Like, and this is a human example of what happens a lot with a horses. A lot, a 
a lot. lot. We Very hear common. This, I hear this a lot. So this is um, a woman in her 70s, has been an equestrian, has had several injuries. And due to her injuries, the surgeons told her that one leg was two and a half inches shorter than the other. So she's been led to believe down this path. They've actually put and how a wedge long, in her shoe. How long ago did she take that on? How long ago this was she This is probably told? 20 or 30 years. Yeah. So she's been living in her brain thinking mm -hmm. that confirmationally she has one short leg, mm -hmm. one long leg. And the best way to, to diagnose that for me, a real quick way, is take them out of gravity and put them on the floor or a table. And as soon as she got on the table, her legs were even. So when she went from vertical to horizontal, mm -hmm. her legs were equal. Yes. Yeah. So then you say, how can that be confirmation? Right. Right. And the other thing, it's very tricky to do. You need somebody who's quite good at it with the right instruments, but you can measure the actual length of bone. Right. And so measuring the length of bone, and this is what they discovered with research on horses, where one horse had a really flat pancake hoof and the other one was clubby and upright, uh, and the shoulders would be asymmetrical, people would assume the horse, or even if the hips were asymmetrical, right. horses get, um, they'll put them up against a wall and look at it and say, look, one leg is shorter than the other. But then in research, people started actually measuring the length of bones and they said, no, like it was something outrageous, like 95 to 98% wow. of the time, the bones measure the same length. So then you say, why is there this asymmetry? That's coordination, which is related to posture. Right. Yes, related to use, habits. So what happened when you put this woman on the table? And obviously you told her, did anybody else tell her that she actually, her legs could be even, that that was a possibility rather than a confirmation or a physical anomaly. It really was a posture and use issue for her. Yeah. It, um, she was also told by her chiropractor that. Again, on the table. On the table. <laughs> so you take people out of gravity it gives you more information. I don't really can't do that with a horse, I guess. <laughs> hard. Yeah. Very difficult. That's a kind of hard. Yeah. Um, but yeah. And it, it's amazing to me how people take on that information. Well, we're told by professionals who yeah. we trust. And if that's the belief, the brain is going to, the whole nervous system is going to reorient around the idea of that confirmation flaw, right? And that's what limits people with horses all the time. They go, oh, they're sickle hocked or they're, they're straight hocked or they have a long back. But and I meant as some other podcast, I will pull out the little confirmation books I have on how they judge confirmation in horses. Yeah. But what I find fascinating is the way they judge confirmation is the horse shows up that day. And what they're really looking at are relationships mm -hmm. between external points on the body. So a relationship of the length of the neck to the length of the back. But the back can appear longer or shorter if the pelvis is very engaged or disengaged, right? So it's the point of the hip to the last rib or the hock relationship to the stifle. And all of those relationships between body parts can adjust with postural changes. And so I go, what are we really looking at with confirmation? If the relation, if the external relationships of points on the body can change with changes in posture, then it, I go, what is confirmation? And I go, okay, confirmation is the size of the bones, can't change that. If there is an actual discrepancy in the length between the left front leg and the right front leg, okay, you can't change that you know, you'd have to work around it. But I think like this woman, when you get her on the table with the horse, you can feel what, what she had would be probably related to a permanent holding of a twisting action in the spine. 
which in the it's a rotation function of the spine. Mm -hmm. It's very common with horses to have a rotation issue. So in the human, it's sort of a twisting action. And if you put that in a horse's body on a horizontal plane, it feels to the rider like a rolling action side right. to side. So the whole thorax feels like it rolls when the spine is twisting excessively. And I've been on horses that were severely asymmetrical that changed. That's right. what you can do by retraining the posture and the habit of movement, which is what you do. And it's what I do is retrain the body to um, unwind some of the habits that are not useful. And we all, I don't care whether it's horse or human, we all have to have help to really experience the full potential, the best use of our skeleton or of our, of our body. That takes I training agree. no matter who you are. Exactly. Yeah. I'm yeah. still working on it. <laughs> so with people, we could say there's body types and there's mm. sort of, you know, but how do you think of an athletic or not even athletic, I want to say just a person who moves with good skeletal coordination, who's well organized. Are there certain characteristics that you see, no matter whether they have long legs or short legs or long torso, right. or short torso, whether they're a little chubby or a little skinny, whether they're kind of muscle up or they're sinewy? What are the things that you see that are in common when somebody has good use of their body, good posture? That's a good question. And I think we, we do the same when we're watching equestrians and horses is sometimes we can't put our finger on it, but it just looks easy. It looks yeah. seamless. It, you know, all those words, uh, what have I else I graceful. heard? Light, yeah. graceful. Um, there's just a sense of ease and effortlessness in, in the body when it, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Like if I list off a couple of athletes and this will maybe show my age, cause I don't follow sports <laughs> closely, but I go to watch Michael Jordan play basketball it was amazing. Mm -hmm. You know, like maybe he had longer bones than most. So he starts with the confirmation that naturally makes him a good basketball player. Right. But everything else was developed skills, some talent, but learning to coordinate his body, even compared to other professional basketball players, he could defy gravity. He could organize his body in a way that made basketball look effortless mm -hmm. and so light, like he had more time in the air than most players, right? But if I look at like one of my all-time favorite hockey players was Wayne Gretzky, of course, right? right? And to watch him in a totally different athletic endeavor, you know, and both of them had a quality of the movement, even though different sports, different body types, there was a quality to the movement that was effortless, that was sharp, that was keen and quick, but not ever rushed or frenzied. Yeah. And I, I see the same thing in horses. It's, I call it the balance between self-propelled and self-controlled. And that That's could good. be at any speed, right? So self-propelled, self-controlled. And people will tell me that, oh, my horse can't slow down because they have bad hocks or they have bad confirmation or they can't really go fast because they're just not built for speed. They're upright in the shoulders or they're, you know, long in the back, something like that. And I go, all of that's changeable. That's really interesting because uh, I, this is the, it happens. I've only had one person come to me and not do this. Most people will walk in and tell me everything that's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, yes. yes. I've, I've had one client in 30 years, 20 years come in and say, you know, I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about what's going right. Mm. So that's, that's real interesting where we tend to what we think is the problem. Mm. 
So that's very interesting to me. Instead of, um, well, Mio Morales has a phrase, where else do I seem a bit easy? Can we look at where it's going well? Yes. No, and biologically, we survive by focusing on problems. Yes. Right? So our survival is a little bit, our evolution is supported when we focus more on what's wrong than when we focus on what's right. So we really have to put more effort into staying in a positive mental frame of mind, into looking for solutions rather than focusing on problems. All of that takes more effort on our part because biologically it doesn't really help us survive immediately, but it does have a huge impact on our long-term health. Yes. So it's, it's very, it, a different way of thinking and we have to override what comes most instinctually easy to us. Yes. So in different sports, one of the, one of the things that kind of sparked this conversation between us was talking about, I think a specific memory I have where I had a chance to really watch Leon Harrell up close and personal. And he was a, he was one of the first guys in cutting, um, cow cutting that won big money, won like he was one of the first really successful cutting horse riders on the national circuit. And I just got a chance to watch him up close and personal, get to know him a little bit when he was in Colorado. And I remember being struck by the development of his horses because I was doing jumping and dressage at the time and sort of learning about cowboy stuff, but it wasn't, it wasn't something I was super familiar with. And Leon had these amazingly athletic horses. He had one little filly, he could cut a cow bareback and bridleless. I have no idea how the man stayed on Yeah, right. because it is fast <laughs> and furious, right? But all of his horses, I looked at him and I told him this, I said, look, your horses I could take out of the pen, stick a dressage saddle on and go win a competition. They were just beautifully developed. They look like they're quarter horses, so they weren't big warm bloods, but they were developed muscularly very much the same. And they could move athletically cutting a cow, which also meant they could move athletically doing lateral maneuvers, piaf, right. passage. They had the athletic capacity to do that. And they looked the same, which was the first thing that struck me. And Leon's so humble, he goes, I don't know, a thimble for full of dressage. But he goes, I do know what makes a horse athletic. That's I, interesting uh, that you brought that up because when I was nine years old, I had an off the track thoroughbred and <laughs> I did cutting on him. And I actually got third place in the state in open cutting, competing in New Mexico, competing against adults. Wow. <laughs> and they, they, these old cowboys were not happy with me. <laughs> <laughs> little, little <laughs> On this snapper. 16 one hand thoroughbred. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes. But why can't? So it's like it, it doesn't matter. You know, you can take a thoroughbred and do cutting. It, you know, it's not, if they're athletic, they're athletic. Yes, absolutely. And some of that's what sport is. It's a higher athletic demand than just going for a little trail ride on your horse or for us taking a leisurely walk. It's, it's a higher demand on the body, but the demand can create positive stress yes. when we watch the posture and use of the body during the stress, then you're strengthening the body and the development is obvious. I like that. That's important. Yeah. And if we're stressing the body in poor posture, mm -hmm. then any conformational challenges, which we all have and all horses have, mm -hmm. are exacerbated. Exactly. They're stressed, right? So you find the weak link in the conformation if the posture and mechanical use of the body is poor under stress. I go, that's it. That's the difference between confirmation and posture. But none of us are born perfect. And I think when people go out, because there is some truth to finding a horse that's just built athletically, that has great confirmation. What you're paying for with a high dollar 
young horse that has great confirmation is the breeder having the knowledge to help genetically spin the wheel in their favor. It doesn't mean every baby on the ground is going to be perfect. Right. It's a, you know, it's a potluck thing with genetics, but they've learned how to select breeding in a way that gives you confirmation that's advantageous. But that's all it is. It's just advantageous. So not every seven foot guy is going to be Air Jordan, right? It's like, just because you have the confirmation or like with your thoroughbred, just because your thoroughbred was 16 two didn't mean he couldn't cut a cow. Exactly. Which is down and low and fast. He loved it. He just pin his ears back and get all ugly. <laughs> yes, I love that. <laughs> Yeah, my Arabian love tracking cows and yes. pushing cows around. So like when we get a, because sometimes this will happen, just like the lady you talked about, some professional will tell us your horse's front leg on the left is shorter than the right, or this hind leg is shorter than that hind leg. See, they don't match up when you stand them against a wall. And for us to just pause and go, like in my mind, even if I have genetic anomalies in myself or the horse, even if I have poor confirmation, maybe I have to work harder on skill development. Maybe right. I have to have more, more conscious control over my body, but it's not a limitation. It doesn't mean I can't do it. And when somebody tells me I can't do something, I go, now I got to do it. <laughs> <laughs> now I have to do it. <laughs> Jack Russell. I know. <laughs> yes, not mayor. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's interesting to just pause and think and go, thanks for the information. Mm -hmm. I don't doubt that the professional telling me that is authentically believing it and trying to help me. I don't right. believe they're leading me down the garden path. And I they're usually well educated people and and that's where their learning stopped was at that belief system. And when people give me a bad diagnosis, I go, okay, so you've reached the end of what you know. Let me go find somebody else. Right. That's because, second opinion. <laughs> yeah. Or I go, I believe there's a solution out there. I really do. I go, if I can find, and sometimes that has taken me years. I agree. Years. And I go in the interim. I take the advice that's helpful, but I go, I know the solution is out there somewhere. So even with my horse, I've had several horses that had horrible conformational challenges and I go, okay, so we just have to find our own unique path into better coordination of the body we have and better force management over the movement. I go, now we're shifting from the realms of biology to the realms of physics. I love physics. <laughs> I go, because force is something you can manage even if you have biological challenges. And would you agree uh, um, that for every horse, it's a different path? It can be a different path. Yeah. No, and the truth is the, where we have the challenges, like with para riders, they still learn to ride beautifully. They still function at a very high level, but they have challenges to their confirmation or their biology, but they work it out. And the same is very true with horses. And the horses that struggled the most taught me the most. Right. So the way I recognize, and this just happened the other day, I got on an older mare who hadn't been ridden in a long time. Her body development was poor. She had had an injury that took almost a year to heal to a tendon in her hind leg. She was just getting back in work. And so I sort of expected the ride to be challenging and see what she could do. And that mare was so fast and so quick and so light at actually finding very good coordination in the very first ride. That's what I call talent. Mm. I go, despite her development, she knew kind of how to best coordinate her body. And even though it was fatiguing to her, she 
followed the lightest aids and the lightest directions to reorganize her body when I was riding, I go, that's what I call talent, that they can just do it without big stuck spots or, or defensiveness, emotional oh. defensiveness, right? Yeah, they just sort the of, I can't do it syndrome. Yeah. yeah. I go, that to me speaks of talent. She is a, yes. sen- and a, she is a sensitive horse and knew her body coordination very well. And I go, when I, when people ask me about talent, that's the quality I call talent is that the coordination comes easier for them for some reason. And we don't really know why, but even if it doesn't come easy, we can still gain the exact same coordination. That's the difference. Yes. Okay. With help. <laughs> and if I looked at this mare's confirmation, she would have won no ribbons at a confirmation ah. class <laughs> at all. Right. She'd have that little broodmare out of shape look. <laughs> yeah. But her movement, the way she could organize her movement was so quick and it was easy for her. So I go, ooh, that talent is going to move her rehab very quickly. That's the difference. It, I think that's really important. What you brought up is that the difference between looking at something that's static and something that's in movement. Yeah. That can be two different things. And I love it when I get that surprise because yeah. usually <clears throat> you look at the body and you kind of know how the ride's going to go. You know, <laughs> you know, it's going to be bumpy or it's going to be a struggle. And she had that kind of body. And I love it. Every once in a while, I'll get on a horse that doesn't look good and it will just surprise me how seamlessly they can get their coordination and move better with, with little guidance. I go, I love that. You're just yeah. stumbling across a backyard super talent. <laughs> and that's how you know. It, it's just like, who is the racehorse who <clears throat> was backyard bred uh, a couple years ago? I can't think. Oh, Smarty Jones, right? Smarty Jones didn't have all the right look, didn't have super confirmation, backyard bred, but they knew he had something. Maybe they couldn't put their finger on it. And that horse did well. Smarty Jones did very well. But that's what the racehorse industry is always looking for is bloodlines, right? Bloodlines, number one, confirmation, number two. But I go, a lot of people who buy good confirmation or buy the potential of talent sort of think of it as a shortcut and wow it could be a shortcut but you still have to develop the skills of the sport or the skills of of taking talent to an even better coordination that's you know why athletes have coaches that's why they train right And I see a lot of times that these super expensive, really talented horses, the talent gets sort of stressed and used up Mm. rather than developed further. Instead, they're sort of taking the good confirmation and the athletic ability from good breeding and saying, great, I don't have to work as hard, which is true, but that doesn't mean I, I can bypass skill development and go directly to my sport. I think that's really important when you talk about skill development, because if you think of our elite athletes, they're not training by doing their sport. No, yeah, no, there's so, lots of cross training. Right. And, you know, the big buzz in current sports medicine is mastering your own mechanics, getting control over how you run, how you throw, how you swing. All of that makes a huge difference to your long-term success in the sport, but also um, staying healthy in your body. Right. Not having a repetitive injury or strain. Right. Because of the sport. And so it's a very big deal in human athletics, but I think the horse business is always a good 50 years behind everything. (laughs) So (laughs) we haven't caught up much with the same idea. But just to change our thinking is important that yes, like when, when I walk through a barn, a hunter barn, all the horses are muscularly developed exactly the same way. They all have the same (laughs) look. If I walk through a dressage (laughs) barn, 
you know, they all have the same tight spots, the same overdeveloped this and underdeveloped that. Yep. That's what I call fashion of the sport. And yep. because every horse in the barn or within a 50 mile radius looks the same in that sport, <laughs> we think that's what it should be. Right. Right. But if we look at top athletes across the sport, you know, um, I think it was Mary King long ago doing badminton looked like she was just having a little, you know, hack through the park on a Sunday going through the badminton <laughs> cross country course. It looked easy for her horse. Her horse was beautifully round and smooth and didn't look like a greyhound. You know, her horse looked like it could do dressage and was super cross country. And that's what good body development looks like, no matter the sport, right? So to me, for a horse, a horse ideally looks like one long, smooth muscle from nose to tail. You don't see, like that. you don't There's see no body, bodybuilder lumps. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I like that. The, you know, you, the neck's the same length, quote unquote, as the torso and so on. It just flows together. Right. That yeah. you don't. And when you run your hand down the back, it's not from the withers low and tight into up and lumpy. That's an overused <laughs> loin muscle. Right. Or what we call the apple butt, the overdeveloped gluteal. Oh, right. Or we have a name for that's called a poverty groove, which is a deep line which is really an overdeveloped tight hamstring on a horse. It deepens that groove at the, on either side of the tail on the back of the hind legs. Mm -hmm. and so that, that's too much pushing. Too much of the leg extension. backwards. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so originally it was called a poverty groove because if a horse is starving, the line also deepens. Oh, that makes sense. <laughs> but you can have a very well-fed horse with a deep, poverty groove, which is just really a strong definition between the hamstring muscle and the gluteal muscle. And so what that means is like when we can see overdeveloped muscles that take away from a smoothness of the body line, those are tight muscles. That tells you you're overdeveloped here, which means you're underdeveloped somewhere else. Right. right or, exactly. Humans are the same. Yeah. yeah. I got stuck. This is a funny story. I was hauling horses somewhere and I've got my big trailer and I thought, oh, I'm going to take the back roads. It won't be as crowded. So I'm on a little two lane road and I get stuck behind a bicycle race. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought to myself, hmm, how can I... <laughs> I make good use of this time. <laughs> so I started watching the cyclists and how they were moving and using their legs. And it was amazing to me that all of them had a push leg and a pull leg. How did you see that? Because the way <laughs> you have to way... explain this. <laughs> <laughs> the way their butt moves on the seat. <laughs> oh, yeah. So you've got a, a, a push leg that you push down with and the other leg you pull up because they're in toe clips so they can push and pull. So that just fascinated the heck out of me. Oh, yeah, because the toes. Like, oh, are my supported. gosh, there's habit right there. Pardon? So how could you tell from the butts which one like was the push leg bulging more and the pull leg lifting more or how did you tell from the use that's of a the good way to put it usually what they you could really see it going up a hill because then they would stand up and really rank over onto one side to push and then the other leg kind of pulled and then jam down with one leg and this leg comes up <laughs> Ooh, interesting. that was fascinating i thought wow yes You're no and when i habit. talked when I had a nice conversation with some Ironman com competitors, they were talking about how people who naturally run heel first landing, mm -hmm. they just can't win. Like one of the things they retrain for sense. is if they are a runner who tends to land heel first, mm -hmm. they have to go back to basics, back to walking and retrain 
how they coordinate. And they were a little focused on the foot for my taste. I told them, I said, it might go higher. <laughs> you might think about your spine controlling the foot, but basically figuring out the coordination to get their feet to land more toe first or to the interesting mm -hmm, or to the, the, what do I want to say? The, the pad of the foot. That makes more sense because if you land on your heel, you've jammed all your joints all the way up. Yeah. He said it'll, it'll wreck your body yeah, faster than anything. Mm -hmm. And knees, hips. Yeah. And he said, you, you actually increase the vertical force by doing that, which they're trying to reduce when they run. That makes sense. They're trying to minimize lateral forces and vertical forces to increase their time or do better in their time running. And so how they land on the foot is a very big topic in that world. <laughs> Interesting. And to retrain a body habit. And again, if you think of that, it has nothing to do with confirmation. Exactly. Nothing to do with it. If you have a functional spine, hip joint, moving legs and a foot, you can change through conscious effort and awareness. It's not easy, but it's possible to change that you land. I guess they described it like at the front of the arch, which makes sense to me because then well, that's the tripod. It's kind of where, you know, the biggest load could could be taken safely. Yeah. Yeah. And it activates the arches so that you're getting a little bit of that elastic strain energy when you run, which gives a buoyancy, a lightness to the movement. So it's all kind of the same, whether it's human athletes or horses. And, and I do even like the lady who was told she has a shorter leg, she probably thought, I can't do certain things, probably right. crossed her mind, right? And if you're a little bit ornery, <laughs> you go, I just haven't figured out how yet. There's That's a solution out there. Yeah, I, that you brought that up. So when I went to ride yesterday, I thought, well, let's see how coordinated I truly am. I'm going to start mounting on the offside. And I really had to pause and reorganize myself, but I did it. It was very fluid, but I did have to pause and, and you know, think a little bit differently. And redirect, yes. And redirect myself like, oh, yeah, okay. But it's, it's there, it's available. Yes, yes. And every once in a while, I make sure I get on a horse from the ground because I usually do the mounting block. And it's like, I just want to see if I still have Ooh, that I'm coordination. Have to try that one. <laughs> <laughs> Only on certain horses. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I mean, when I grew up and lived out west, it, it, out west, it was like, if you want a mounting block, go get that bucket or get to stand on exactly. that log <laughs> or get on that fence. Get on the fence. That's what yeah. I remember the fence or the gate. Yeah. And when you write yep. English, the mounting block is always ready for you, which is it is better on the horse's back, which is why I use it. But every yeah. once in a while, I just need to make sure I still can get on on the left side and on the right side from the ground. I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to work on that. Yeah. And I've done that with certain this riders guy. as a sort of test to the nervous system to get on from the offside. And I would say 90 percent of people put the wrong foot in the stirrup first oh. <laughs> like it's just so habitual <laughs> and I go you might want to wait that's there that's powerful right there <laughs> yeah that's huge yeah because I, I go that. you'll get on but you're going to be facing it's the wrong be way, going the wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah but it's like you'll catch yourself if you're off on the off side of the horse to mount from a mounting block you'll just automatically stick your left foot in the stirrup like wow. it, or you'll feel your foot wanting to go there that's even, where i even... was that's where i had to pause yeah and inhibit it's like okay redirect redirect yeah <laughs> and that's what you're redirecting because your left foot is like ready to spring into action yeah. and it's yes. a psychophysical thing you know it's it's that pre-program that we have to change in order to do it yes Yes, and I think that's the, the biggest point of the talk today is 
like every time I hear somebody tell me about a confirmation problem in my head, I'm going, wah, 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 wah. <laughs> <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> Story's over. That's the deal. How sad, you know? And it's like, that just, it, you know, lights me on fire because I'm like, oh, that's just a challenge. That's just yeah. an opportunity. You might have to take a little bit different path. You might have to adjust how you get to the same place. Right. But we can all get to the same place because I go, even people who are born missing body parts that don't have the same anatomy are still functioning beautifully and doing yes. things that when you have a full intact regular anatomy are doing. So it's not an excuse anymore. It's something to factor in, but it no longer, it, it no longer is a reason not to try. I agree. Yeah. And arthritis is the other one. When people tell me, oh, my horse has arthritis. It can't do this, this, or that. I go, who doesn't have arthritis by the <laughs> age? <laughs> who doesn't have arthritis? <laughs> <clears throat> And I go, when I had an arm injury, I luckily I didn't break anything, but when they did the x-rays, they're like, wow, you have a lot of arthritis in your shoulder. I was like, really? They go, yeah, it's old. It's ugly. It's been there a long time. I'm like, news to me. Totally asymptomatic. <laughs> yeah. I didn't have any pain. And I mean, now they say the best thing for arthritis is movement. So I go, that's not yes. even a good excuse anymore. It's arthritis. Good point. Yeah. So anything else you want to add? Because the point we're trying to make today in this topic is take on confirmation advice with a grain of salt. Rethink it. And yeah. even, with, even with legitimate confirmation issues, you can still guide your horse into better posture. We can still guide ourselves into better posture because that's a function of force management. Yes. And the solution to bad mechanics is good physics. That's really I like all that. it Did is. I... Oh, I write that down. Write that down. No. <laughs> yes, because force management is how we organize movement. You know, all the we can go exactly. all the way back to our podcast on Newton's laws of motion. But I go, I live with those laws every day. They're good yeah, friends me too. of mine. So, and also if we're involved in a sport, we might want to take a look at the body development of our horse, because maybe the competitive edge is in finding cross training or a little different approach to improve the mechanical use of the horse, right? You could do that on a trail ride. You could do that on, in flat work. You can do that on easy days where you actually and it's not easy for the horse or the human to retrain the coordination of the body. It's it can not. take some time. It is. And it's always wants to go back to its habit. So. Yes. But the habit is just the habit. And when exactly. you like to really gain a competitive edge, all of the top athletes in riding, I go, their horses aren't looking all that different. That's true. A well-developed horse, an athletic horse is an athletic horse. Then you yes. point and shoot and go, my OTTB can cut a cow <laughs> and, and get yeah. third place. Like, that's awesome. <laughs> I'll have to sh get you the picture someday. I do have a picture of it. Yeah. So anything else you want to add to that, Deb? No, nope, that sounds good. And I hope that lady, now she knows her leg isn't a couple inches shorter, has a new lease on life. Yeah, she will. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you guys for joining us for another Horse Geeks podcast. Please like, subscribe, share, uh, comment. We love the comments. Yes. And until next time, we hope to see you back here. Thanks very much for joining us. Bye, everybody. Be kind.